Okay, welcome back. Now we're going to be talking about some commonly used study designs and measurement approaches and implementation science. So this is a common framework developed by Enola uh, Proctor just to help us situate where we kind of place implementation and dissemination outcomes. So as you can see, we've been talking about you know, evidence-based interventions. So once we have selected one, dissemination strategies are, again, really about how do we get that out to the key decision makers. And implementation strategies are about you know, once they've agreed they're going to adopt this evidence-based program in their schools or their churches or their work sites or their senior centers, how do we actually get it embedded and delivered? So typically, when we think about a lot of um, outcomes in research and public health, we tend to only think about you know, behavioral or quality of life or health outcomes or health equity, um, how an intervention has addressed these issues. And implementation science, often those are important, but they're often a little more distal or, or secondary. And often the primary outcomes that we're evaluating are what we might call dissemination outcomes and implementation outcomes. So they're a little more proximal. So it's a bit of a shift in thinking. And again, often because we're testing things in new settings or populations, we're also often collecting data on the health behaviors or health outcomes because we want to make sure that it still works in these new settings or populations where it hasn't been tested. But equally important are these more proximal types of outcomes, which I'll go into. So dissemination uh, outcomes are really, what are the effects of this focused distribution of kind of you know, information or intervention materials to a specific public health or clinical practice audience? So if you had a specific dissemination strategy that was um, you know, maybe trying to use um, inter interpersonal communication or champions um, within a school district to kind of be the um, key leads in terms of crafting the dissemination messages to get all the principals on board to adopt this new HIV prevention curricula for schools in New York City. Your dissemination outcome might be, okay, we've tested out this strategy of using these champions and these specific messages. Does that actually encourage the adoption, the quicker adoption or the more widespread adoption of this curriculum within the New York City school system? So that's the type of outcome you might look at. So maybe this would be measured as a change in the attitude or behavior of the principals within the school system towards the curriculum. It might be about their awareness or receipt or their use of information. It might be about their intention to use the, uh, the innovation or the curriculum. So, or it might be about their initial adoption. So you could do a survey within the New York City school systems to see based on the strategy that we used, um, how widespread is it, is it actually adopted by school principals? And you might just do that by asking them about their intention to adopt it within their schools. So again, this is often a key, identifying a key stakeholder at um, a community or clinical setting. So whoever that kind of key decision maker might be of whether or not an intervention or program gets adopted. So that would really be a dissemination outcome. Implementation outcomes are often the effects of our specific strategies or actions to implement the interventions. And we'll have a whole session on implementation strategies. But it might be whether or not your implementation strategies um, were effective or successful. So again, maybe you have all the principals on board. They say, based on your dissemination strategy, most of them say that they intend to adopt it and that in the next school year, they will integrate and have teachers trained to actually deliver this new HIV prevention curriculum. So then implementation outcomes might be, okay, we have all these people on board. Now we're going to see whether or not, based on training people, providing technical assistance, and having teacher champions within the school, whether or not that actually promotes the actual implementation and delivery of the intervention. Because you may know, people can kind of say they're on board, but then that's very, very different than them actually delivering it. Or maybe the teachers say that they, maybe they get trained, but then they maybe don't actually deliver it. So it's really about the effects of these specific strategies to actually implement and, and, and integrate this new intervention. 
This is, can be uh, measured in a variety of ways. And I think what's interesting about implementation science is you often have multiple outcomes. So it's not unusual maybe to have two or three of these. So, and again, this would be informed by your stakeholder input and your partners. So you might wanna understand acceptability of the intervention in the setting. Um, maybe you're also looking at initial adoption or use among the teachers. You might be looking at perceptions of appropriateness, uh, feasibility, fidelity. Are they delivering it, uh, the original program, if it has six different modules or components as part of this curriculum? Are they just delivering one or two? Or are they delivering the full range of the modules? The cost of implementation. This is a huge issue. We often, in our interventions, um, have no data on cost. And this is one of the factors that is most influential in terms of whether or not stakeholders in community settings are actually able to deliver a program um, or adopt it. So cost is hugely important. And then sustainability. Are you actually able or is the setting able to sustain the program and all of its components over time? So again, often you're measuring multiple of these, and often you're getting the perspective from not just one decision maker, but multiple. So maybe the principals, the students, the teachers, maybe the parents. So again, this is a multi-pronged approach to measurement. These are just some more detailed descriptions of what this might look like. Again, acceptability would be really the perception that the intervention is satisfactory, Adoption would be about kind of their initial decision um, or action to use it. Appropriateness would be about kind of what's the perceived fit or relevance or compatibility of the intervention from the perception. And again, this is hugely important, um, particularly if you're delivering an intervention in a brand new setting or brand new population. How appropriate do they feel like it is, particularly if you've made adaptations? What's the cost? Um, the feasibility, how successful can it be carried out? You know, if you're delivering something within electronic health records, um, but maybe the system, you know, is kind of like just newly coming on board in terms of that. Is it actual, actually feasible to deliver an intervention in that, in that context? Um, fidelity, again, is the, the full extent of the program that was originally developed being delivered? Um, what's the dose of it, the quality? How well is it kind of being adhered to? And then again, sustainability over time, you know, one, year's, one year out or more, what's the extent to which the original program is still in place? There's some great measures. Um, Brian Weiner um, has some really nice, short, pragmatic measures on feasibility, acceptability, appropriateness. Um, but a lot of these things like fidelity might be really specific to your program. So there's not necessarily a gold standard for things like that. And sometimes this is done as self-report depending on the resources you have available. In some of my studies, I've done self-report in combination with um, some kind of observational check, kind of as a, as a quality check in terms of triangulation. In some cases, people um, might video record um, sessions, for example. Um, this is not always feasible and possible. So you always have to work with, if evaluation is a key piece of the work that you're doing and it's important, you have to work with your stakeholders to determine what makes sense, what's feasible um, in terms of the evaluation piece of this. And again, just to demonstrate, um, again, this is a more detailed version of the Proctor model that I showed you earlier. Again, there's no one implementation outcome. There's multiple, and it's really about prioritizing which ones are a priority for you and your partners. As I mentioned, multiple stakeholder perspectives is a key part of implementation science. And you will know best as the experts in your community and setting um, who needs to be at the table. So again, this might be families, this might be implementers, this might be public health um, care advocates, this might be frontline practitioners, this might be agency administrators and leaders, this might be policymakers. But it's really critical to be successful and um, really learn in implementation science that all the key people are at the table. Um, it just makes sure and ensures that you're getting a really full perspective and understanding of what's going on um, and that you get a sense of what's meaningful. So you don't want to be just collecting data and evaluation information for the purposes of collecting data. You want to make sure that the data you're collecting is meaningful and actually actionable and can inform the work that's being done on the ground. 
So you need to make sure um, it's important to the stakeholders involved. What you often hear is that cost is critically important. So that often cost, um, fidelity, acceptability, and appropriateness are very common implementation outcomes. Okay, study design um, is another component. And again, there's no one right way um, to design a study. You have to always think about what's the question you're trying to answer. How much involvement do you have? So with some of my community studies, um, they're already delivering an intervention. It's been in place for 25 years. So I'm not able to change that. Um, they're actually doing the work. So in many cases, um, depending on the setting you're working in, you might not be able to influence what's going to be delivered. So um, that's uh, that's an issue in terms of the design options that you have. There's also ethical issues of what does it mean if you already know a program is evidence-based, can you ethically withhold it um, and, uh, and have a control condition where no one receives it? And in many cases, you'll find that there's not true control groups in this type of work because ethically, people are not comfortable with not providing the program. So sometimes the program is delayed. You'll have a delay wait list type of design, but in many cases, there's other options, which I'll go into. Um, there's always issues around cost and resources and feasibility. How real world you want to make the study? Um, a lot of people in implementation science want uh, to impact real world settings. So in most cases, people want to make their designs as real world as possible. Um, and again, what's important to stakeholders in terms of what's feasible and appropriate for the design? So in some cases, you might be doing observational studies. So I have a study where I'm studying sustainability as it's happening. I'm not intervening. I'm not introducing anything new. I'm just trying to learn from my community partners about how they're able to sustain or not sustain evidence-based cancer screening programs in community settings. So again, you might just learn and see what factors are important, what strategies are important, without actually randomizing anyone to something new. So this is a common type of approach. Another approach might be, again, something where you're introducing something new. So maybe you're testing. Maybe you have 20 churches um, in DC that you're partnered with. And you all have an evidence-based program, for example, uh, to promote physical activity. But maybe you don't know the best way to actually get that embedded. You have all the pastors on board. You have the church leaders on board. But you all don't know the best way to actually make sure that the program is integrated and delivered and actually impacts uh, the congregation. So you might have some groups receive um, a community champion type of strategy. And you might compare that to an approach that might use uh, training and technical assistance. Um, and pastor leadership as the strategy. So you might be able to randomize those different churches. They're all getting the intervention, but the way in which it's being embedded or integrated might differ. So again, there's lots of different ways that you could think about this, but this might involve experimental studies. In the clinical setting, um, what we've seen is that people are moving towards what they're calling pragmatic clinical trials. And this means that instead of trying to do randomized trials where um, the populations are not representative, um, the practitioners or the, or the alternatives or control groups are not real world, they're trying to make everything be as real world as possible. And they're trying to make the data that's collected actually being meaningful to decision makers and policy makers. So we're seeing in the clinical settings this move in implementation science towards what they're calling practical clinical trials, which is exciting. In more community types of settings, what we're seeing is this move towards, instead of doing a randomized control trial where certain people get something and other people don't, uh, again, because of the ethical issues, this is not always appropriate um, or um, it's not always acceptable um, by our community partners. So in these cases, we're often doing what we call stepped wedge designs or dynamic waitlist designs. So in this case, everyone would get the program, and, um, but the timing at which someone might get the uh, implementation or intervention is randomized. So you might have 20 sites. The first five might get it within the first six months. The second group of cohorts, the next five, might get it in the second uh, six months. So again, everyone gets it, but the timing at which they get it 
is where the randomization gets in, uh, randomization comes in. So again, there's issues. This addresses the issue of the ethics because everyone's getting the program. It also helps with the logistics because if you had to think about intervention and implementation at 20 churches, that timing might be really, really difficult to do within those first six months. So it helps um, kind of ease some of the logistic pieces as well. And so really you can think about modeling the effect of time, both the pre-test, post-test at a specific site, as well as um, across sites, pre-test, post-test. And again, the difference is there, the time. So here's an example um, from a recent implementation science article by Tara McCrimmon, who was one of my students and who I'm very proud of. So they're doing this amazing work on substance use in Kazakhstan. Um, and they have a whole uh, implementation timeline. So you can see they're across three different cities. So they have this whole startup phase. And then you can see um, the first city is getting uh, the intervention and the implementation in months 13 to 18. Then they're rolling it out to the second city in those next set of months, and then the final city. So again, the timing at which they received it was randomized, but everyone is getting the intervention. So again, this is a nice, a really nice approach that we're seeing a lot in implementation science. Okay, hybrid designs are also um, increasingly common. So you might hear about this. And again, this isn't really a design. This is more about the emphasis in terms of whether or not you're fo focusing on testing does an intervention work or you're looking at implementation research. What we're seeing is um, there's a lot of studies that are starting to do hybrid one trials. So this is, might be where you're testing does a program work? Does this inter is this intervention effective? But at the same time, you're embedding implementation questions. So maybe one of your research aims embeds the questions while you're looking at does it work of um, what are the barriers and facilitators at the organizational community and uh, individual level that might interfere with implementation in this real world setting? Or if we were to scale this up um, you know, across multiple clinics, what would we need to understand in terms of the contextual factors or the health disparity uh, issues that might impact whether or not we can actually implement this to scale. So that's kind of a hybrid one. The hybrid two is still testing, does the intervention work? You know, is this food security intervention effective? But it might also be testing at the same time the best way to deliver it. So is it better to deliver this, this food insecurity program using technical assistance and training, or is it best to um, study this using a, champ, a community champion model? So again, there you're looking at both, does the program work and how do we embed it? And then hybrid three is really focused on testing implementation and understanding implementation strategies. So this might be similar to this um, stepped wedge design, where you're really thinking about understanding the implementation strategies. And you still might measure some of the impact on health behaviors and health outcomes, but that might be a little bit secondary. So again, there's a range of types of designs people are using to make sure that we're not just embedding the implementation science questions at the end, that we're starting to think about implementation from the beginning. Okay, the third type of study I'll spend less time on, but there's also approaches we're seeing, in, particularly with policy, looking at systems dynamic modeling, simulation, and social network analysis. So here you might want to think about if you're trying to study policy implementation and whether or not one policy might be more effective in addressing health equity and what policy might be more cost effective. You might be able to think about using data and collecting data to kind of do different simulations to see which policy should be adopted or which implementation strategies should be adopted. So this is something that we're starting to see more of. Um, there's huge interest in this area in the field, um, but a lot of gaps. So there's a lot of opportunities for thinking this through. What's been a gap, I think, in particular is some of that data in terms of the costs or the appropriateness or what the strategy should look like. And I think this is where community-based participatory engagement can come in, in terms of filling some of those gaps and filling some of that information in terms of what uh, the inputs are for that modeling. So there's some interesting work. Lindsay Zimmerman um, is starting to do some of this work on participatory systems dynamic modeling, which I think is really innovative and interesting.
So Tom Valenti and his colleagues have looked at this. So they looked at whether or not network ties influence the ratification of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And they did this globally. So they looked across 168 nations. Um, and so they looked at what they found was that exposure to other countries who were part of this online network of global tobacco researchers and community were more likely to ratify. So again, this could be an observational study, but you could start to understand networks um, and dissemination networks that might support and facilitate the adoption and implementation of evidence-based practices, policies, or guidelines. So this is an interesting, uh, pretty innovative area of work. Um, there's also some work on social network analysis. So we often talk about um, community champions or opinion leaders and how they're really central in terms of influencing the actual adoption and use and integration of evidence-based programs or practices. And so what people have started to do is start to think about how can we use social network analysis as a tool to either understand that network and maybe potentially accelerate adoption and use within a network. So if you were thinking about, you know, a network of um, school principals, again, who were trying, you were trying to influence to adopt this new HIV prevention curriculum, you could think about informally or formally mapping that network, starting to get a sense of how are those principals connected? Is there someone central in that community network? who would be really critical, one of the principles or schools that is really central and that everyone seems to be tied to and that everyone seems to go to informally or formally for advice. Um, so it would be really critical to make sure that you get them on board because they'll serve as a model and kind of social influencer in terms of potentially um, influencing adoption of the curriculum within that network. So you're seeing that approach increasingly used in implementation science. Um, Tom Valente has done some great work on that. Uh, Shobha Ramanathan has done some great work thinking about networks and building community capacity in community organizations. So this is a really interesting area as well. And then I'll say it's not a specific study design, but almost across the board, implementation science is all about mixed methods designs and thinking about you know, still using quantitative methods to think about impacts, you know, costs, effects on implementation outcomes, you know, really quantifying impact, but almost always using qualitative methods to understand kind of the how and why. Because at the end of the day, you can find that implementation worked or not, but if you haven't embedded some of the qualitative methods to unpack that and understand that, you often you know, don't, as you're moving forward in your work, you, you don't necessarily have the answers on how to imp improve or inform your efforts. So qualitative is seen as key. Again, often because we're working in complex contexts, again, these are real world settings that are complex and messy. So the qualitative can help us get at that. It's really critical too, because so much of the work we do in implementation science is about stakeholder engagement and involvement. Um, qualitative work can really um, help be a tool that's used to help um, shed light and give voice to stakeholders. Um, it can help compensate for one set of methods. So we might be limited in terms of the number of sites we have to work with quantitatively, but the qualitatively can um, be used to kind of bolster that and again, provide important insights. And again, there's lots of great work. So there's, there's a whole um, area of work on mixed methods designs that's coming out, Creswell, Larry Palinkas, um, they have great references. Um, I think when you're doing mixed methods work, you have to be really clear about how you're using that, both um, how, how are the qualitative and quantitative being used to inform one another in both the data collection and the analysis. So in some cases, maybe you're using a convergent model where you're answering the same question with the quant and call. In some cases, it might be complementarity, so maybe they're getting at slightly different um, angles or issues. Sometimes they're in sequence. Maybe you first do the quantitative, um, you have a finding, and then use the qualitative to understand it. So again, always thinking about how they're complementing one another and working together. And again, I highly encourage you to bring in qualitative research in your implementation science work. Again, it really helps us understand context, complexity, bring, bring in stakeholder input. 
I think there's a lot of um, gaps and limitations of our existing frameworks in implementation science, and I think we can think about refining them um, and bringing in kind of a health equity lens more explicitly through the use of qualitative research. Um, and again, I think it's critical when we have quantitative findings to help us understand kind of the how and the why of our findings.